Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight for a conversation with Tina Chang and Mira Jacob. My name is Jeffreen and I'm the executive director of the Asian American Writers Workshop. For those of you who are new to the workshop, AAWW is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to celebrating and uplifting Asian diasporic literature and storytelling. At a time when our communities are specifically vulnerable, we continue to offer a public and virtual space in which we can imagine a more just future. All struggles for freedom are intertwined, and at the workshop, we stand in support of those in the fight to end systemic racism, violence, and hate in any form. Visit aaww.org to learn more about our programs, fellowships, and more. Tonight, we are celebrating the paperback releases of books by two incredible authors and friends of the workshop, Tina Chang and Mira Jacob. Books are available to purchase courtesy of Books Are Magic, and you can find the link to purchase books in the chat. And so without further ado, I am delighted to introduce Tina Chang and Mira Jacob. Tina Chang is Brooklyn Poet Laureate and the Director of Creative Writing at Binghamton University. She's the author of Half Lit Houses, of Gods and Strangers, and Hybrida. Hybrida was named one of the best books of 2019 by NPR, Publishers Weekly, Lit Hub, and was the Paris Review's contributor's favorite book of 2019. She's been published in McSweeney's, The New York Times, and Plowshares. And she's also received awards from the Academy of American Poets, the New York Foundation for the Arts, Poets and Writers, and more. Mira Jacob is an author and illustrator. She teaches at the New School and is a founding faculty member of the MFA program at Randolph College. Her critically acclaimed novel, The Sleepwalker's Guide to Dancing, was a Barnes & Noble Discover New Writers pick, shortlisted for India's Tata First Literature Award, longlisted for the Brooklyn Literary Eagles Prize, and translated into seven languages. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, Electric Literature, Tin House, Literary Hub, Guernica, and Vogue, and she has a drawn column on Shondaland. Again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And now please join me in welcoming to the virtual stage, Tina Chang and Mira Jacob. Everybody, how are you? My name is Tina Chang. I'm so happy to be here. I wanted to thank the Asian American Writers Workshop, Jeffreen, Lily, and all of the AAWW staff the workshop has been a huge part of my life uh, since its very beginning and since I began as a writer just many, many, many years ago when I first started writing, when I first graduated from college, I did not know what being an Asian American writer, citizen, woman was until I walked through the doors of the workshop. And I really say it very often that I would not be a writer without the workshop. Uh, meeting Ken Chen and meeting just a host of incredible artists and thinkers, uh, makers, writers, uh, philosophers, just everybody, performers there really shaped me as a writer. So I'm incredibly grateful. I'm also so grateful to Mira. It's, it's no secret that her work has just really inspired me. Our books, uh, were written pretty much at the same time. We both had sons. We have sons the same age. We were writing during the beautiful glory of the Obama days. And the book was also written through the election of Trump. And it's, I think it's actually quite um, poignant during this time that we're still, that we're entering into another election that I've just been rereading her book and loving it so much. So I'm so grateful to Mira for taking this time with me today. I'm actually gonna just jump right into it and I'm gonna show you a video because I wanted to be able to share with you what exactly inspired this book. My book is called Hybrida. Hybrid is from the Latin hybrid, and it's the combination of two or more unlike things. I am Chinese American. My husband is from Haiti. He's Haitian American, raising a mixed race child in America um, really set me on a course to rethink my own identity and what it is that I even meant by identity to begin with. And uh, I started thinking about what protection actually meant for my son. 
as a mother, I could have all the hope in the world to want to protect my son. And then I realized raising a boy of color, a brown boy in the United States meant eventually sending him out into the world and what would need him. And would the world care for him as much as I did and still do. So I'm going to just show you a video because uh, this is a sort of a mixed media book that I have. And this is one of the videos that sat in my imagination for, for a very long time. And I'll tell you a little bit about it after I, after I share it. Come on back. Come on back. Keep walking backwards. Keep walking backwards. Okay, turn your head. Yes, sir. What is wrong? Like this. Hold on, hold on. That's six and eight and eight and nine. What are we doing? Hold on a second, okay? Hey, what are you doing? Oh, my God. You're a parent my children. We got a complaint. stop share right there for a minute and um, thank you for watching that with me I, that was one of the videos that was very difficult for me to get out of my imagination um, I'll tell you a little bit about that video that uh, the woman that you saw her name is Kamitra Barber and she was driving home in Forney Texas in August 9th of 2014 and she had four children in the car under the age of 10. And she was stopped and she was handcuffed by police officers who were responding to a call. And they were searching for four men in a beige or tan Toyota. But Miss Barber's car was a burgundy Nissan Maxima. Her son emerging from the car was six years old. So uh, my son, at the time that I was writing the book was the exact same age as that boy. Uh, I started having conversations in my mind with Kamitra and I couldn't stop the conversations as much as I tried. And I tried very hard to suppress my poems, to suppress my poetry because I felt as if Kamitra's story and many mothers like Kamitra, it wasn't my story. But the more I tried to suppress it, the more the poem was urging to try to come out into the open and um, I even have a line in, in, in the book that says, um, by speaking my, about my son, do I, appropriate hit, do I appropriate his existence? I return to the language of mothers. And I'm going to read to you a poem that I wrote that was in response to, to um, this video. And this video is also, by the way, within the book itself, it's embedded within one of the poems in Hybrida. And I'll share my poem with you. I thought it might be nice if you could actually see the poem that I wrote and that way we can participate in it together. Um, let's see, okay. Fury. My son rubs his skin and names it brown. His expression gleeful as I rub a damp cloth over his face this morning. Last night, there were reports that panthers were charging through the streets. I watch from my seat in front of the television, a safe vista. I see the savannah. Sometimes though, my son wakes to a kind of nightmare. He envisions words on the wall and cannot shake them. 
He tries to scratch them away and runs out of the room, but the words follow him. None of it makes any sense, but it's the ghost of his fear that I fear. What is a safe distance from the thoughts that pursue us? And what if the threat persists despite our howling? Buildings collapse. A woman falls down the stairs and lands on her back with only one eye open, half awake to her living damage. I think my son senses what's happening on the street, his heart fiercely tethered to mine. I know the world will find him and tell him the history of his skin. Harm will come searching for him and pour into him its scorching mercury, its nails, its bitter breath against his boyhood skin, still smelling of milk and wonder. Somewhere, the panthers are running, starting fires fueled by distinct hunger. Somewhere, there is a larger fire, a pyre stirred by the fury of all that we have done, all that we could have done but did not. Its flames lift the underside of the earth. It propagates needing only a frenzy of air to fan it to inferno. I'll call that the forest. The deep woods are ahead, and if the panthers could just reach it. If I told you that all of this happens at night, you wouldn't believe me. If I told you that all of this happens in the future, always the future, you would continue following the scent you could only describe as smoke. I'll call that justice. But aren't we talking about mercy and its dark twin? Isn't that what's pummeling history on the side as I write this? Isn't it the thorn and the taser? Isn't it the chokehold and the gold arm of vengeance? I say it from my mouth, and when it spills forth, it lands on the ground in a pool of light, reflecting back at me the one true blasphemy, love and 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 love is crowding the street and needs only air. And it lives over there in the distance, burning. Thank you. Hey, wow, um, Tina. So I just have to say, I'm really so glad to be here. And um, Hybrida is one of my favorite books of last year. Um, our books came out at the same time. And so as Tina was explaining, we've had some conversations about um, what was propelling us, and we're going to have a conversation here tonight, but it is really wild to put out a book from a place that feels very um, private and somewhat uh, harrowing, and then find a sort of sister book out in the universe, and that's what it was like for me when I first opened Hybrida, and, um, and I read a lot about what Tina was writing. So I'm also going to read um, tonight, I'm going to read a little bit of my graphic memoir. And um, I don't know if you guys, you know, with with Tina's reading, I felt, um, especially I think as we get closer um, to this election, I feel like it's really easy uh, for kind of all the keys on my piano to be played. So I'm just going to say I'm also reading about the election, you might feel things, I feel things a lot right now. Um, but I think I think it's just, it feels really nice for me to be in this community right now. And I also wanna just thank um, the Asian American Writers Workshop and Lily um, for bringing all of us together and, um, and Jeffreen for bringing this kind of, this quorum of us together because it feels nice to be with you guys tonight. Okay, I'm gonna read my piece, hold on. Here we go. Okay. This is October 31st, 2016. What happened to going as Michael Jackson? Not three years in a row, daddy, sheesh. Right, okay, so soldier it is. No, I'm the head of the FBI and the CIA and the army and I do special ops. Special ops? You know, like moonwalk if the situation required it. Another Donald Trump, we've seen three tonight already. Oh yeah? Oops, sorry. Yeah, Zom zombie Donald Trump, vampire Donald Trump, and Donald Voldemort Trump. Hello, Brooklyn. 
Are grandma and grandpa still voting for him? Last I heard, yes. Maybe they changed their minds about it. Maybe. Maybe we should call and ask them to please. No. Nope. But if we beg them, absolutely not. Because you guys aren't talking anymore? Sweetheart, I need to tell you something, a kind of grown-up thing. Your grandparents aren't going to change their mind about this. It's just not going to happen, and I don't want you asking them to do that, okay? But aren't they scared Trump is racist? I don't think they think of him that way. So he's not racist? No, he is, but I don't think they're really looking at that part. And we're still talking, by the way, just less often. And they still love you. You okay? I'm sad. Yeah, it's okay to feel sad. I'm sad too. Chapter 38, how it happened. Can you tell me again? Which part? I was big, right? Yes, eight pounds. And you came out <laughs> with connected eyebrows and all your hair and you looked like a little man. And then what happened? And then we stayed in the hospital for a few days and you didn't recognize me once. The medicine made me woozy. So when the nurse came by with this loud crying baby, I said, whose baby is that? And she said, yours, like I was crazy or something. And I had a mohawk, high and fierce. Grandma tried to comb it down, but it wouldn't stay. It made us all laugh. And Alma, Alma held you for hours. She was so much more excited about you than she ever was about me or Uncle Arun. Really? Definitely. And then Obama got elected. He did. We had all our friends over to watch the election results and we took turns holding you. Did you know he could win? He would win? You know what's funny? I went up and down Philly with flyers for him, knowing he deserved it more than anyone, but I still didn't think he would until he did. Why not? I guess by that point, I was just so used to the best person not winning. If he, he what? Nothing. And then what happened? And then we cried. We cried and cried and cried. All of you? Everyone. You ever hear the expression, I had to pinch myself to believe it? Yeah. That is a real true thing that happens. Sometimes your brain is so surprised by something it feels like you must not even be you anymore. You're weird, mommy. Did daddy cry? Yes. Daddy never cries. That's true. But he cried for Obama? He cried for you. He cried because our new president was mixed race just like you. And America believed in them, in him. And suddenly there's a new place for you in the world. And then everybody danced. We ran down to the street with you and everyone on our block was yelling and you could hear the cars honking all over Atlantic and Flatbush. Was I yelling? No, you were asleep. You were just a little baby. I think I remember it. Maria? Yeah, I remember everyone and also the fireworks. There were fireworks? Yes, they were all over the sky, all over the whole city. Boom, boom, boom. I remember. And this is just one last little bit. November 8th, 2016. We had a party. We invited friends. We were hopeful and ready for it to be over, and then we weren't. Why are you making me go to bed when everyone is still here? Because you're tired and it's gonna be a long night and you have school tomorrow. Is he really winning? We don't know what's happening yet. Then why did you start crying when they showed Wisconsin? Why did daddy come and hug you like that? Because daddy knows when I need a hug. Can you stay with me a little? Everyone is so sad out there. You should sleep. I think Caitlin and Thunny were crying in the kitchen. If the president doesn't like us, does that mean the army doesn't like us? What if they only like daddy? Will he have to give us up? That's not gonna happen. You said he wouldn't win. Shh, shut your eyes now. And that's the end. Thanks you guys. Oh, 
Yeah, that was so great. <laughs> I'm, I'm, we're supposed to enter into a conversation, but you know that feeling where you just want to just sit with the work for a while? Yeah. And I mean, I couldn't believe I <laughs> after I was listening to it. I was like, that's great. I'm just going to cry. <laughs> I and mean, that's the space that I'm in. And that's the space I was in last night, actually, just thinking about everything that's at stake right now and just reliving that whole feeling, reliving, honestly, really happy feelings too. that moment when I was pregnant with my son and watching Obama's inauguration and just feeling all these wonderful feelings like, wow, my son is going to be born into the situation where he's going to be able to watch like a mixed race black president and how amazing that will be and how proud he was growing up for a majority of his life until he was like eight years old and then all of a sudden everything kind of changed so that sort of brought it all kind of back for me again and you know I don't know if I had a chance to really thank you for writing this book and it's just so incredible and um I know that so many people feel the same way who have read this book, who feel such a close connection to this idea of feeling seen, you know, feeling really seen in a book and um, feeling just um, that, you know, this idea, like, can a book save you, you know, can a book mm. do that for you? And definitely um, your book has done that for me. I felt recently reading Kathy Park Hong's minor feelings has done that for me where I was like, you know, yes, the entire time just, you know, and getting a chance, thankfully, to be able to tell her that myself too, to tell her how much I felt like her book just kind of held me and, and, and caught me when I felt like I really needed it, especially now the current climate is so different. Um, I just want to keep talking, but I feel like I'm, I should ask you a question. So I'm going to start off. Can you, can you hear me? I'm going to take Let's take this out because my audio can you hear me yeah okay great uh because i feel like that was not helping me but there's so there i have like kind of nitty gritty questions that are really like tougher questions but i feel like i should start in a place that just is just a maybe just about process the other day i was talking to the poet uh, eduardo corral and he was uh, he was talking about his book guillotine and he said something so interesting he said you know i feel like when writers of color are sort of at the forefront and we're talking about our books almost always like we're asked to talk about our subject matter he's like so little of the time we're asked to talk about our craft he's like and that's a huge part of the book and so it, it made me think like maybe I should just start off with like a craft question for Mark. you like how you decided I'm sure you've talked about it but it's still a beautiful process to talk about is like how you went from traditional prose, you know, having the line sort of like move across the page and having that feel like a very satisfying feeling to moving to, uh, you know, a graphic quality, you know, how did like, what did the first frame look like? Like, when did you decide to just pick up a pen or how did you do it? I'm sure audience members would love to know. Sure. It's such a good question. And also because I think um, when you were presenting your work, I was I was having the same feelings. You know the the part where um, you're trying to take in what the world is showing you, but it feels like there's like a foot like right here, and you can't you can't like move, and you can't breathe, and you can't think, um, and you just sort of feel yourself locking. I think that's what my experience of 2013 and 2014 was and it only got more amped up from there but what i remember specifically about 2013 and 2014 was how few of um my white friends and family were feeling the same way and it felt really terrifying to me to be so alone in it and you brought up this really really smart and um, interesting thing which is what do you do when you are so often in this America told that, um, first of all, a lot of the pain you see, you're adjacent to it. But then you're also told that whatever you feel is pain is not nearly important enough to express in any way. Like, what do you do with that? Normally what I would have done with that is write an essay trying to explain that. Um, I mean, Kathy, uh, Kathy did it, Kathy did it much better. Um, but, but that's what normally I would do that. Right. But I couldn't, 
do it. And I, when you're, when we're talking now, I'm realizing it's because I think I felt that, pr that pressure, like that thing of like, I can't move anymore. I don't know how to do this anymore. I don't know how to explain it to you anymore. I don't want to explain it to whoever you is. I don't even want to talk to you. I want to talk to us. I don't know how to, how do I talk to us in the, in the, in the best easiest way was honestly just for me to think of like, I know that everyone is having these conversations. I know the us is having these conversations. I know the us that is having these conversations will understand these conversations. And then it was just, how do I, how do I get there quickly? And how I got there quickly was just by drawing us as these kind of paper puppets. The first one I did was me and um, my son and I drew us and I just ran to his room because he was obsessed with Michael Jackson and, and got all of his Michael Jackson albums and threw them down and just put us on top and then made the conversation, cut it out of paper and put the put that on top and then stood and took a picture of it on my dining room table. And then I cropped out my feet and sent it to someone. Like that's literally what the process was. It was <laughs> super sophisticated. Um, <laughs> but it was with this, it was, it was with this urgency and this feeling of like, I don't know how to be the person that's supposed to be good with words anymore. I don't know. I don't have a bandwidth for it. And it just has to take another form and I don't know what it's going to take, but I'm breaking. So something else has to break too. Did you it, feel okay? I'm scared because you literally said something that I said to a class just the other day, I was visiting a class and I told them that my vessel, whatever vessel that I was writing in was breaking. Like it was as if, like, if you could imagine that it's a, like whatever it was that I was writing, if it, it was a vase, like there were cracks coming out and it was leaking everywhere. I was leaking everywhere because I didn't really know how to express myself anymore with the outside world. And to be honest with you, and I feel like because we are within the Asian American Writers Workshop and I feel very protected by the Asian American Writers Workshop because they are so part of my making you know, as a writer that I, I really had to really question and re-question myself e even as an Asian American woman, because I was in this space where I was raising this mixed race child reacting to mothers like Kamitra Barber saying, what kind of conversation am I having now? Who, where does this fit in? And, and how is it going to be able to express itself? So I had to have faith that watching this video um, and watching many videos, it reminded me very much of all of us this experience, like when you talk about, you know, the foot on your neck, it reminded me so much of this particular time, watching George Floyd and watching someone's last minute of their lives, like think about how unnatural that is, right? Like we have this window into watching someone's last moments of their lives. And I don't know what to do with it except that I know that my only mode of expression, because I don't know how to have a conversation about it per se, but the only mode of, that I know how to work with is written word. And eventually it wound up in poetry and eventually all these forms sort of like layered on top of each other. And I allowed that to happen. Like I allowed like the video to happen. I allowed visual art to happen because it's the only way that I knew that my mind was functioning is letting it all almost collapse onto each other, letting the vessel, everything break. And then it became a sort of, um, and I don't know if you felt this too, it became like a, like a messier process. Mm -hmm. And I was okay for the first time, maybe it has a lot to do with motherhood, that I was very okay with messy, you know, like the messiness that you feel when you can't even walk out into the world without like a stained shirt and you feel vulnerable and you feel open and everything is just spilling onto the floor. And so I felt like that's the way the process was for me too, in terms of the creation of the book. So when you said that, I was like, yes, that's exactly how I feel. Exactly. How I feel. And it's really interesting too, because I think that the thing that we're, um, that we both were kind of reckoning with in different ways is how much of, um, how much of the story is mine to tell and what part of it is mine to tell? And I think you're fighting two different things in that moment. And one is you don't want to appropriate or take someone else's story, right? There's that um, very real um, trepidation around doing that. But there's also, I think there's the, the kind of underlying fear of um, you don't, I think when you come from a, a kind of vastly under-recognized minority group, you don't feel like you can speak for anyone. 
because you don't know what you look like. Like none of us know what we look like in a way. We've all been kept in these sort of warrens away from each other. We've been kept from kind of speaking to each other about what it looks like. So the idea of trying to speak for anybody feels um, pretty loaded. But I like what you said about, about letting the mess happen. Because for me, a lot of letting that mess happen was just believing that there was an us on the other side of the mess. Yeah. And then while you were creating it, were there a lot, because I noticed that there, you let a lot of messiness, you let your process into the book, which was so great. Uh, for example, there are, you know, conversations between husband and wife that get really heated and where uh, <laughs> I noticed <laughs> sometimes they start off as questions, but then they started questioning each other. And then there was like doubt. And I love how all the doubt and then anger and more doubt sort of comes into play. It's like a completely like disrupted conversation. And that's what happens when we're talking about race, race relations, race relations among family. Um, but I felt so comforted by the fact that you let that process in, but were there a lot of things that you felt or some things that you felt were maybe just too, was there anything that was too raw that could uh -huh. make it in and wound up like on the cutting room floor where there you were just sort of like, I'm raw in this book, but this is way too raw. You know, what's really interesting about that is that it wasn't, I wasn't worried about being raw. I was worried about being vindictive. Mm -hmm. Like that was my cutoff point because I think I'm so, I'm so infuriated by a world in which um, some people are terrified that their kids aren't gonna make it home alive at night and some people are terrified that they're not going to get the tax break that they want to. And somehow those things are put in equal categories. Like that is so enraging to me. There's a very sharp um, part of me that will come out and will detail um, in very quick ways how awful I think that is. And especially with my um, in-laws. And by the way, I've been married for... 14 years or something, you know, I'd been, I'd been with my husband for a very long time um, when this book came out and I had thought of his parents as my parents. And so to, to understand that not only were they not my parents, they were, they were going to vote in this way that was, um, that was terrifying for my entire family and, and their own grandson. I think there was part of me that just wanted to belittle them. Um, and make them feel the point of my rage. But every time I did it, I had to remember that this was also my husband's parents. And it, more than that, it was also my son's grandparents. Mm -hmm. And I had this, I had a kind of moment where, um, recurring moments where I would ask myself, what are you doing this for? Are you doing this for vindication? Or are you doing this for clarity? Because clarity is okay. Trying to find something out about yourself, that's okay. But if you're doing it so that like Twitter America jumps down the throats of your in-laws and tells them they're horrible people, what in you needs that? Mm -hmm. Like what in you needs that? And that part is not going to be fixed by any of this. Right. So it was less, it was less the, um, it was less the rawness that I was worried about and more actually how finely I can hone my rage mm -hmm. and how finely I can wield it. Mm -hmm. What about you? Did you have things that you felt like were off limits? Um, no, <laughs> I felt <laughs> no. you know how you get that question sometimes in an audience, like, um, it, it, it happens quite often where, you know, I wrote this thing, but I don't want to like hurt my husband's feelings, or I wrote this thing and I don't want to hurt my mother-in-law's feelings. Like, how do you feel about that? I guess I, somewhere along the way from just being a writer for all of these years, I've kind of thrown that particular kind of fear away, maybe because in some way, shape or form, I've already offended everybody. You know, <laughs> <laughs> writing all my previous books, I've already just disappointed. You know, like when you disappoint the, the major figures, the major, major players in your life, you know, I've, what if you've already done that? Like, what if I disappointed my mom and my brother or a spouse or a child? Like, what if I've disappointed them in some way by telling my truth? And, oh. then, and then once I did that, it's like, you could just, you're fine then. And then you realize after you did that and after there's an offense and that offense, and they're like, yes, offense 
offense taken, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, I came out with a like a New York Times piece. My mom just like she she just in the days that she could drive over, she just drove over. She's like, I'm offended by the entire piece. I felt I felt the whole thing was completely untrue, and I'm like, yeah, but this is my truth, mom. Uh It's my it's my truth, and you have to allow me to tell my truth because I was very deeply hurt by so many things that happened. You know, so much, so much. you know, deeply buried racism in, in my family that came out in all these passive aggressive ways that I felt like I needed to express and talk about in, in my writing. And, um, you know, I think that I've kind of put all that stuff away now. Like, I, I feel like if, if I've done it already, then all I can do is like move forward and continue to do it because <laughs> now it seems like almost like a, not necessarily a pleasure, but it feels like, um, a part of the creative process to be continuously mining, exploring, trying to tell the truth, even if it's in opposition to everybody else's truth, you know, because there were some, and I don't know if you felt this and, and maybe it's good to talk about, it's like, there were some lonely times, like when writing the book, there were some lonely, low down times, like where I was basically crying into the pages thinking, number one, what am I doing? Number two, is anybody going to be interested in what it is that I'm making? Because it felt like such a singular story of a mother speaking about her mixed race child. I hadn't really seen that particular book yet. And so I, I really felt like I was reaching in the dark. And you said in one of your quotes in, in Bob Magazine, I think I don't want to take it out of context, but you were saying something about the idea of being terrified. And, and, uh, but I should, I should put it in context because you said, I live with and love many of the people in this book, especially my families, which goes back to what we were just saying, like who we're offending. Um, I wrote everything I needed to, and then went back and edited down to just the essentials. I asked myself repeatedly if I was writing for clarity or vindication. And if the answer was the latter, I cut it. I'm aware of the climate we're in and how easily internet mobs are mobilized. So I know that writing any of this is a risk and it's terrifying. So I was so interested in this idea of being terrified. Like, did you mean terrified in writing the material? Did you mean terrified with, you know, those people that we were talking about, the ones dearest to us, that we would offend them or hurt them in some way? What were you terrified of? Yeah. I mean, such a, um, I think when I think about that, I think about the fantasy that America has about interracial couples, that, um, that if you're in inter- an interracial couple, I think there's a, it's sort of a twin fantasy. One, one of the fantasies is that like, um, uh, we all just really get each other and we really, and like, we're having beige babies and the beige babies are going to save the universe. There's that version, right? And then there's the other one that's right under that, which is that one person or another in this relationship doesn't feel like um, doesn't feel okay about themselves and they are accepting something that is subpar, right? There's like that kind of nasty underlying thought. And so part of what I was terrified about was this idea of stepping into a space that said, uh, sometimes those, like it's not that either of those things is all the way true sometimes both of those things are true. And sometimes being in an interracial relationship looks um, like in my case, I'm married to a white man. So there's a lot of things that come out with the white patriarchy. And what does it mean to live in a place where you love somebody, but your real relationship holds the same things that America does? And what does it mean to expose your relationship to the world, that, especially to a country that has a fantasy that is not supposed to look anything like what your relationship looks like, right? And so just knowing that, knowing that I was gonna do that was terrifying. But the other part that was really scary was also like, what if I lose everyone? I mean, if I lost my in-laws, that's, I I would say, you know, they lost me too, but like, what if I lose my love? Mm -hmm. What if I lose the faith of my husband? What if I lose the sanctity of my kid's heart? Like, what am I doing here? What am I write about, about these very fraught things that could hurt everybody? Um, and I think that's what the, the terror was about. But then the, 
the other side of that was I just keep feeling like I can't be the only one. I can't be the only one that is this fucking scared all the time, <laughs> you know? And, and you're not, because when I was, that's what, see that, I think that writing, it's like writing in a state of terror is where we need to be like that idea, like going back to sort of like the workshop experience, right? When you're sitting in the workshop and almost always somebody asks somebody else in the workshop, like, well, what's at stake? I think when you're writing in a state where you're completely terrified means like everything's at stake. So when I, so when I was writing hybrid, I, I was scared. I was like on the edge of my seat like every day, just thinking, what am I, will it be accepted? So my biggest fear is like, will it be accepted? Um, will it be my biggest fear is like, will the Asian American community accept okay. me? Like that was probably like my, the biggest thing that was on my mind because I mean, I felt like when I the material came out, there was such a strong and positive reaction from the Black community that I felt so embraced and we were actively involved in a conversation with each other that I wondered, I wondered the same thing, you know, like the places and spaces where I grew up, I thought like, oh, read this, accept, accept me and accept me for what is, so there's the sort of me walking around in the, in the real world and the me on the page, like, I hope that you can read this mm -hmm. and accept it for what it is and all the, all the difficulty and rawness of this space. Can we enter into this conversation together? Mm -hmm. um, wow. And I think that for me, like that's why this conversation feels so important to me to be able to feel sort of seen and to enter into the difficult spaces of conversations. Like for example, um, this past year with the strength of Black Lives Matter and this, with the strength of, Asian American communities like really coming out and saying, you know, Asian Americans for Black Lives Matter, that meant a great deal to me. And then at the same time, I was like digging underneath the surface thinking, well, there's the expression of a, of a desire. Yes, I support Black Lives Matter. And then there was this other side of it that I was sort of saying, well, how, how does it, how is that lived out every day? in my personal communities where I felt like, and I can only say for myself, I can't say for all Asian, only myself, I felt within my spaces of my Asian American community and my family, I felt like there was a lot of work to be done before they could make that statement. So yes. during the months at the height of the protest, I was like, what are we really talking about? So I went into sort of like my space again of like hiding and being terrified. Like I'm like, I'm terrified of this, of this conversation that I sort of want to open up, you know, to my personal Asian American community, like, what do we mean by this? And then the more I asked the questions, the more I felt like I saw action, I saw action, I saw young people going out and marching, making statements, standing up to their parents, like so many amazing things were happening during that time. And so yeah. it kind of felt like it gave me like, it allowed, it resuscitated me a little bit. It allowed me a chance to breathe when I saw like that big, beautiful uh, crowd that was outside the Brooklyn Museum, how beautiful, everybody wearing white, everybody there for each other. And I felt like, okay, yes, you know, like, yes, I can, I can buy into that. Like that is the state that we all need to be in, like vocal out there speaking to one another. And maybe the spaces that I was living in where I was like really angry at my ancestors and really angry at my mom, like maybe I need to kind of put that aside for a little while and look toward like this future that's so incredibly exciting, amazing and supportive mm -hmm. and opening out into all these great spaces. I don't know how you felt during that time when there was this great, you know, support from the Asian American community toward the Black community and what your feelings were about that conversation. So it's, it's um, you know, I had, I think I had the same um, experience that you did in some ways where I felt relieved that it was finally happening in a way that felt palpable. And then I felt, and I very quickly was like, oh, this is in the hands of the youth. The youth are directing the conversation and it's a much smarter conversation as a result. I felt that as well. But I also, I wanted to ask you, I mean, so I felt those same things. What did your son, did you, did you talk, how did you deal with that with your son? Or how did you deal with that in your family? Like, what does, did you guys have a conversation with your kids? Were you talking to them about it too? Or was it? I, mean, I think, you know what it is? It's like, I think among uh, mixed race families, we're, we're, we're just always talking about race. 
Yeah. It's always at the dinner table. It's like when we walk across the room. When we're, I mean, it just was constantly. That's why your your book and the conversations that were happening, especially between husband and wife, mother and child, it meant so much to me because those are the conversations that we're having all the time. The conversations about race relations in America from the moment that I conceived of my son till now, that happens on, on the daily, you know? So it wasn't like a new sprung conversation for us. It just was like a continuation, but maybe we were acknowledging that more of our personal communities were kind of trying to jump in. And I think what we were trying to do is we were trying to put a lot of our personal feelings of anger and it's okay to say anger, like anger at our own personal communities who we felt like didn't want to engage in that conversation with us for so long. We're like, I had to just say it one time in my mind and let it go. Where were you? Hmm. Where were you when I wanted to have this conversation with you? Where were you when I wanted to have this conversation about what was happening between the Asian American community and the black community? I needed that. And, but now, but then at the same time, I had to then again, put that aside and say, but, we're here, you know, like, let's have the conversation now. And I had to, you know, enter into that space. Cause otherwise I think I would stay in the space where I would just be upset and angry. And how long can I, you know, fester in that? I need to just sort of open up. I mean, that's, that to me is very much about the double consciousness of being a person of color, right. In America, that's very much about um, having, you know, even just always having to, even with the good news, parcel out the portions of yourself that are going to be able to take it in because some part of you has to stay um, tough and some part of you has to, you know, because the heartbreaks are also real. So it makes sense to me that both you would have to have that conversation with yourself and have to give over to it. But I feel like to me that, honestly, that's the hardest part about living in this body is how many, how many different kinds of heartbreak I can know, you know, how many, kinds of faith I will try to hold on to and how many different kinds of heartbreak I will know from trying to hold on to it. Yeah. And this, and this happens on a daily basis, right? Every day you rise, you know, my, my husband says, you know, no matter what's happening every day, I rise as a black man in the United States, you know, trying to just get up, you know, as much as, as much as the world is trying to, to beat me down, surveil me, you know, watch me, make me into a criminal. I have to get up in the morning. And I needed my family to realize that. I was like, let us for a minute, for a minute, you know, sort of put certain issues that we have aside so that we can realize like how somebody else is walking through the world. And I think that, you know, literature can do that. It can allow us to live in these spaces for a while. We can completely embrace somebody else's experience. Yeah. But, I, but I wanted to make sure we are, Mira, are we answering everybody's questions <laughs> that are yeah. on the side? On the chat, I to go back a little bit. And uh, uh, I, I'm very, I just want to say to everybody, I'm, everybody who's in my class knows this. I'm very bad with monitoring chat things on the side. <laughs> so I'm going back, back. There's many questions that we haven't answered. Um, okay. Let's see. Questions. Uh, okay, you can just choose one, Mira, and, and answer. Well, I see one that, the first one that I'm seeing is the one that um, from Catherine Egan is asking me, uh, my students are wondering how Jed's parents feel about Trump now and how they felt about your book. So um, I think that's a really interesting one to tell you just now because we're in an um, interesting space. Jed's um, father passed last year. Um, but uh, I will just say that coming out with the book, it wasn't I think everybody wants to feel like if you come out with a book like this, that like all of your family is suddenly going to be like, I get you. I understand now. Um, it wasn't that experience. I came out with the book and I showed it to them before and they were, I think probably short of the fantasy of someone having a total about face with their own beliefs. They were as, um, as kind as they could be. They said, this is, you know, some of this is painful for us. We're sorry you feel that way. Um, we're not ready to talk about it. And that was where we were for a very long time. Um, and more recently, um, I think we're getting to a place where we can talk about it again, a little bit. Um, and that is interesting to me. And it's, um, it's very um, brittle ground, 
So I don't want to overstate where things are, but I feel like just the fact that we can even talk to each other at all to me feels like some, like an act of resistance. Um, so that's where I am with that. Thank you for that question. Tina, I saw there was one for you. Do you want me to find it for you? Uh, sure. I'm just really, I'm trying to like, in my mind, summarize all the questions. It's just what I do when I'm in a state of like, I want to answer everything all at one time. <laughs> but if you, do you see it? If you, oh, okay. There's one from Renee Yassine for you. Tina, why did you choose poems for these big stories hybrid and needed to tell? Why was prose not enough? Was it less terrifying or more terrifying to write in poems as opposed to prose? Oh gosh, you know, I think that, uh, hi Renee. I love Renee. Um, and Renee, thank you so much for that question. You know, Renee, um, cause I know Renee is also a singer songwriter, just, you know, multi-talented person. And uh, I have to say Renee, poems were just the space that I always felt the most comfortable in, to be honest with you. I felt like when I was very young, I did try my hand at just longer prose and I, I have to be honest, like, I think I failed pretty miserably at it where I felt like it, it felt like it was Django pieces. Every time I took a piece out, something else needed to be answered. And I felt like it was just a lot for me to handle. And I found that when I tackled poems, I cre could create in the shape and this form that made so much sense to me. And then also what's really interesting about hybrid is I did actually allow prose, short prose to enter into the space. I wrote a prose piece uh, called Revolutionary Kiss that combined um, the stories of my husband and um, the stories of my history because I wanted to try to find a way to express like all of us being here, right here, right now, it is some people don't believe in a miracle. It is just, if you don't believe in miracles, it's, it is our ancestors fought for us to be here. Our, the fact that we are sitting here with each other right now means that there were revolutions. We had to travel countries. We had to cross borders. There were, there was fighting. There was, there, I mean, there was so much to get us to this space. So that story, Revolutionary Kids, which is a prose piece really tried to, you know, that was as probably as long as I could probably move, but it kind of really tried to expand the story because in that case, I couldn't quite fit it into a poem. I had to be able to allow a larger breath to sort of come out to be able to say, well, the history of Haiti is the history of revolution. 13 years, if we can think about it, my husband and I were talking about uh, when is, how is real change going to come? This is a great question for everybody. How is real change going to come? And he, his answer was like, well, honestly, if we look at history, real change has come from revolution. Real change, honestly, has come from some violence where then the powers that be look at that violence and examine that violence and says, well, we need to change something because that can't happen anymore. The Haitian revolution came about because they decided, the slaves decided, no more. You will not own my body anymore. And it was hand-to-hand -hand combat for 13 years, right? So that, how could I contain that in a poem? I didn't know how to contain that in a poem. So I had to expand outward into a longer prose piece. Wow. And I think there are some questions for you, Mira. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, but this is sort of for both of us, but I would love it if you could answer this. It says, how do you anticipate that your stories will change as your son's children grow older and are able to change and question what they are seeing and experiencing as a mixed race child in Trump's America? Wait, so, does my have to grow older in Trump's America? Is that what that... <laughs> I was like, can we say not Trump's America? <laughs> <laughs> it's our America. See, that's a, that's the thing. That's the thing. It's it's our America. It's not Trump's America. But I understand what you're saying, Anita, and that's a great question. It's sort of like, how will your stories change as your as your children change? Yeah, I mean, I what's so funny about that is um, when I wrote this book about the moment in which my son was six to eight, and then it came out, and he was already ten by the time it came out, um, and one thing that I noticed and we talked about before it even came out was I said to him, you know, you don't, it, people might want you to perform a certain kind of racial innocence because that's who you were when I wrote this book. 
if anyone ever asks you to do that, just know that you don't have to do that. He, I mean, I said this to him, by the way, I said that to a 10 year old, it's like, what, uh, what does that even mean to a 10 year old? But then we went to readings and people did do that where they said, um, do the part, do the bit where you do the, the thing, say the thing about Michael Jackson. And they would say that to him as though he was a, you know, like a, a TV personality or a comedian on stage with a bit. And, I, and it was so horrifying to me because of the place that the book came from, which is to say, um, to answer your question in a, in a longer way, I think one of the things that's really exciting to me right now is how deep the conversations are going with my son, how, how kind of how much he has grown, how much he has seen, um, how far ahead of me in many ways, um, his thinking has kind of gone down a, a path. And that is really incredible. And it's incredible to see that in a brown boy who is uh, in our America and Trump's America. And that is, it is vital to me that we keep having those conversations. How that affects my work, I'm unsure of. I don't know if he's going to be a part of my work in the future. I know being a mother will always be a part of my work, um, but I'm unsure if if he will be also part of that in the same way. I have not figured that part out yet. What about you, Tina? Um, well, first of all, your son seems so smart in the book. I mean, I my my son has now read about your son. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that one day they're going to meet each other. Your son seems so intelligent. My, it's really interesting because um, the way that my son reacts to difficult situations is sometimes not via conversation. He actually gets very afraid mm -hmm. and, and keeps very silent about the things that hurt him the most. So for example, within our very conservative neighborhood of Brooklyn, um, I, I sort of wonder, like, when does a when does a boy when does a, a boy of color move from being really cute and adorable to a possible threat? Has that happened and, yet? Yeah, it's starting to happen because yep. he's eleven, and so that to me is an interesting point that I'm thinking, like, will I? Won't I? Write about it. Like I think that right now, sometimes you're so in the hard space of living through it that we're living through that anger now, where we see sort of neighbors, you know, sort of perceiving him now as somebody slightly older and asking him, "Don't play, don't play around my house. Like this is my property." Mm -hmm. Like one thing that racism does is it makes people behave very immaturely, almost childlike. So they will surround their homes with like garbage cans so that so that my son won't go near their home. Yeah. And so you can imagine the, also the, a young boy's first realization, like this is happening to me. Like when we say Trump's America, when Anita said Trump's America, like the realization that whatever, you know, Kool-Aid, he's sort of fed everybody. It's seeping, it's seeping within these really tiny cracks and then it funnels and it goes somewhere and it arrives then at my son, you know, it arrives like in his periphery, in his space where then someone says, you don't come here, you don't belong here. And then he moves from a state of innocence to, oh, a realization, like somebody's saying, I don't belong. I don't belong in the space. And so I, I think as a, as as writers, as artists, I think I'm trying to decide like what to do with that in the same ways that I was trying to decide what to do when I saw the Kamitra Barber video. Um, same thing when I read, when I have discussions, when I have arguments, even with my spouse about race relations in America. Like I, I think I'm in the midst of, when we're sitting in the midst of the pandemic, I'm trying to decide what to do with all that information right now because the writing is going slow. <laughs> Like, I don't know about you, but it's yeah. not moving with the same fury that it did before. What about you? No, I mean, I feel like I'm in, um, I'm deep in some sort of um, hibernation right now, trying to make sense of a lot of things. Sometimes things come out in spurts and sometimes nothing comes out for months. Um, and I'm just sort of living in this space. Cause also I think I have been working long enough now that I know even when this thing happens, when this sort of subterranean freeze comes over me, I know that there's still a part of me that's churning under it, frantically making sense of things. And it just, it just takes a while. I mean, I feel like that's where I'm at right now. What about you? Um, 
it's just going so slow. I feel like right now my focus, my concentration level is really just minimal with the pandemic. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about too much in the world. I'm concerned about the election. I'm concerned uh, about my students. I'm concerned about um, just my, my general community and how they're doing. I'm concerned about my mother. I mean, all these things are in my periphery, but I also think that a writer is always writing even if they're not picking up a pen. I truly believe that. I think that we're always writing, we're always collecting information. The data just keeps running. And so I think that even though I'm not actively writing it down, I think in my mind, I'm still writing something, if that makes any sense. Whatsoever. That completely makes sense. And I think that's actually a really heartening thing because I know there are a lot of writers that will be in this, um, in the audience right now who are maybe not producing as much as they're used to producing. And I think that's actually a really good thing to keep in mind is that even when you're not, when there's not a massive output, there is still something happening. You know, there is still something that's real and vibrant and it has everything to do with how you're perceiving things and this kind of sense that you're making of the world. It doesn't have to come out of you yet. Yes, exactly. I think we're allowed to take one more question. Mira, why don't you choose, why don't you choose the question? Well, how about this um, last one? Did you worry about being thought of angry women of color in your writing? I think of this often when submitting my work for workshop um, because I don't want my message, um, my message, if you will, to get lost because the reader gets turned off by the fury and feels attacked. <laughs> I mean, I've got all sorts of answers. For that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great, it's a great question. Madison, this is a great question. Um, I can say this. So I like to eavesdrop a lot. And so I was sitting in a Brooklyn cafe where an Asian American woman, I was trying to decide what was happening, right? So I needed to lean in with my, you know, with my croissant, like I was leaning in to see what was happening because there was some action going on next to me. And it was an Asian American woman and a white male, and there was heated conversation going on. And supposedly she said to him in workshop, I felt like you have really said things where you just really, you don't understand my writing. And in my workshop, you're just really putting me down. Could it be that mm -hmm. you don't understand my experience, you know, and that's why you're putting down my writing? Could that be it? He goes, well, I'm, I, one of my least favorite things that people could say is like, I'm sorry that you feel that way. So he said, I'm sorry that you feel that way. <laughs> sorry that you feel that way. Um, he said, I could not relate to what it is that you were saying. I'm sorry. And I apologize. I don't mean to hurt your feelings. I just could not relate. He said, and I also suggest that maybe just maybe you might want to find a, an Asian American teacher and maybe that. So his solution was, God, you change your situation. You, and this is always the case, right? You change your situation. You shift your body you shift to the environment the community your your mentors your teachers and I'll just stay right here where I am right this is right not that I will shift I will change what can I do to to embrace you in the space Madison I'm trying I'm, I'm trying to answer your question but what can I do to be within your space so Madison I guess what we're trying to say is like you be you you be in that space of what you where you need to be like no, no apologies. No, I mean, I wrote a poem called Fury that I read to you. I had to embrace that feeling. Like, how could you not? I think there's something going on in our culture where it's convincing us, like, don't feel the emotion of anger. How can we not feel the emotion of anger if we feel the opposite, the emotion of love? Like, we, we need the whole spectrum of feeling, and it's okay in this present environment to embrace the anger. But I, I guess I'm not that concerned with it being perceived as, a, as an angry um, woman of color, because I think that I, I express it pretty often when I need to. Uh -huh. and, but you can see how that, you know, unfolds. Yes. It's also who's doing the perceiving, right? Like, I mean, that to me is the, so that the great part of this question. So just so you guys um, know this book that I wrote, I wrote a rough draft of it and I was in a writing group of, um, uh, majority um, white people, there was one other woman of color, it was a brand new writing group, and I gave it to them and the feedback on it from that group was, um, this book is why we lost the election. This is from white liberals. Um, you're too sensitive. You're so angry. You're the thing that divides America. Um, why are you so angry? This is, this is like, all this is is you being upset about things. 
there was a lot of ways that they critiqued this um, book that were basically, um, you shouldn't put this out in the world. You sound really angry and really petty and really upset about things. And I don't feel that way. And, you know, it was just this really, it was kind of an insane making conversation. But in that moment, there was a great, there's kind of a great moment where I was like, oh, I don't give a fuck what you think. Like, it was an amazing moment just in that it pushed me so far past my point of comfort and being able to have a conversation that I was like, oh, I really don't care. Oh, I really don't care. I really don't care. Um, because I know that my people know that if I'm angry, it's for a reason. And they're not going to try to pretend that that reason isn't real or that they can't handle it. They can handle it. People can handle it. You know, like that's, I think that's the other, the other idea is like, whose emotions do we make space for and whose do we not? So if people think I'm angry and that gives a little more agency to the next person behind me, who's also angry, then I'm fine being angry. I'm actually just fine with it. Yeah. And I think it gives permission to everyone else around you. I mean, just the other day, my husband said, why is it that people of color have to turn the other cheek? Like, why is it that we always have to rise above and turn the other cheek and be the better person, but we aren't allowed like the full spectrum of human emotion. And he's absolutely, absolutely right. And um, I think we're, I think we're at our time, Mira. That was so great. Thank you, everyone. I, I apologize to anybody whose questions we didn't get to. I've been reading all of them, loving all of them. Thank you so much for being such a beautiful, uh, thoughtful audience for us. Um, we just hope that this work is as meaningful to you as this conversation has been for us. Thank you, Mira. Thank you for just everything, for your thoughts, for your book, everything. You too. Thanks for doing this with me. And thank you, Lily, for having us. Yes. Thank you both. I want to ask for a round of virtual applause in the chat. I was just sitting here like snapping at my computer. I'm so grateful to both of you for your wisdom and your and your work and for sharing it with us tonight. Um, I'm the programs manager at the Asian American Writers Workshop. I just have a couple of very quick final notes. Uh, we have a slate of really exciting events coming up at the workshop this fall. Next Thursday, October 22nd, our Open City Fellows will be reading from work they produced over the course of their fellow including some really incredible on the ground reporting from communities in NYC. The Monday after that, October 26th, we are ho hosting our first ever virtual open mic, um, which you can actually sign up for if you're interested. Uh, that'll be co-hosted with Kay Ulande Barrett. Uh, you can learn more about what is on the calendar and you can RSVP to those events and more at aaww.org slash events. I want to thank our friends at Books Are Magic, who are our virtual booksellers this season. There is a link in the chat um, to purchase their books, although you may need to scroll up a little bit through all of the congratulations. Um, please purchase these wonderful books and support your local independent bookstore while doing so. Uh, so thank you again, Tina and Mira. This was so, so wonderful and re-energizing and replenishing. And I'm so grateful to both of you. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us online. Have an thank amazing Thank you, everyone.